I'm here with Richard Susskind. Uh, Richard is a very well-known author and expert in the legal world, especially around how technology is changing um, the legal system and the job of lawyers. So the question I want to discuss here is, um, what will technology mean or the technological change mean for the future job of a lawyer? Um, what are your views on this? How will technology change the legal profession and the job of the lawyer? The first 40 or 50 years of legal technology, and it's a field in its own right, has been largely devoted to taking the work that lawyers do and essentially automating that work. We're now seeing the emergence of systems that can actually take on some of the work of lawyers. So historically, it was about, frankly, word processing, electronic mail, research in the World Wide Web, accounting systems and so forth. Now we're looking at legal research, document analysis, document drafting. So we're moving from the back office to the front office. I always tell a story though, to put this in context, in 1996 I wrote a book called The Future of Law and in that book, and I know this seems ridiculous now, but in that book one of my main predictions was that lawyers and clients in the future would communicate by email. And I kid you not that the Law Society of England and Wales said I shouldn't be allowed to speak in public and I was bringing the legal profession into disrepute by suggesting this. I also suggested the first... There's still, still some lawyers that still don't communicate. The, well, that's certainly true. The Law Society, however, in fairness to them, are very supportive of that. But I also right. said, for example, the first port of call for those doing legal research would be the web. And judges and lawyers said, I had no idea because I didn't understand the cultural and practical significance of the, the law library. So I say this wow. to suggest to you we've got a, bat, uh, a battle to fight, a mountain to climb yes. in build, bringing an essentially conservative profession into the 21st century. My view is that our biggest struggle actually is our law schools are still generating 20th century graduates rather than 21st century graduates. And yet we have a growing body of clients both from the largest companies down to individuals who would like a lower cost service that's more conveniently delivered electronically. And so this emerging field of legal technology, it's beginning to burgeon now. About, if we talk four years ago, there were about 200 legal tech startups in the world. Mm -hmm. There are now about two to 3,000, each of them trying to do in a corner of law what Amazon did to book selling. So I think we're in for a decade of fascinating change. So what are some of the fast, most fascinating examples? So I, so I just seen? say that it's this idea that historically we thought was unthinkable, so that some legal work could actually be undertaken by machines. So I'll give you a, a, an example. If you've got a large dispute, there'll be a huge number of documents to analyze. Mm -hmm. And in some disputes that can be tens of millions, even hundreds of millions mm -hmm. of documents. And one of the ways, and I accept this, that major law firms earn substantial fees is by putting armies of young lawyers mm -hmm. into this document review. And we're now seeing by a form of essentially AI as a form of supervised learning that is you give an expert a sample of these documents, they'll indicate the ones they would isolate as relevant. And from that, the system essentially can infer for the full document set, which document would be likely to be identified as experts as mm. for the case. And as long ago as 2011, we were seeing research emerging saying that in terms of precision and recall, these systems can outperform junior lawyers and paralegals. Mm. We're seeing the same in a due diligence exercise where in a perhaps a major merger, that's the review of a whole bundle of past agreements. Again, these systems, when suitably trained, can isolate the relevant and most worrying documents. Also document drafting that used to be handcrafted systems have been around for some time but now gaining traction where a user is asked a series of questions and out pops a first draft and a fairly polished first draft and these can be made available online mm. to individual consumers to small businesses people who couldn't otherwise afford legal guidance we're also seeing systems that can help predict the outcome of disputes mm. and predict the likelihood of a deal coming to fruition mm. or or not so many of the tasks that we thought hitherto were the exclusive preserve of lawyers were beginning to see machines taking on. And, say, and so I identify for the future a new category of lawyer. I call them tomorrow's lawyer. I've written a book of that title. And they're the people who will be developing the systems that will be solving the problems to which lawyers today are the only and best answer. 
these are the people who will be developing the systems that will be solving clients' problems. So we'll be having legal knowledge engineers, uh, legal risk managers, legal process analysts. We'll be having people who are expert in design thinking. All of these individuals working on developing a new way of tackling old problems. I'm not very uncomfortable with this when I put up my slide of maybe uh, of uh, 10 roles for the future, essentially system development roles. Well, that's not a lawyer. And I say, surely a lawyer is a person who helps clients solve their legal problems. If we find there are cheaper, quicker, better, less forbidding ways of doing that online, then the market will eventually move to that. And so I think in many ways, the legal world's going through the industrialization, the digitization we've seen in so many other sectors. And while I can see for the foreseeable future, there are a considerable number of tasks that machines and systems cannot take on. We have to recognize that law is more information intensive, more document intensive than any other profession or industry. Mm. And on the face of it, it's quite amenable to the use of technology. Interesting. So do you see that technology will replace the, the, the lawyers as we know them today? Or do you see it as more augmenting their job that they will work alongside machines? I see this in 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 medicine, for example, a good example, a good comparison for me, where you mm. have a, a a doctor, and you can actually train AIs to make a diagnosis, and mm. they can hopefully spend a bit more time personalizing a treatment plan, focusing on research. So, what what do you see the the future of a traditional lawyer? A lot depends on time skills. If you look at the twenties. I think the 20s will be an era where systems and human beings will work largely alongside yeah. one another. Some of the work of junior lawyers and paralegals will simply be replaced by technology, I have no doubt about that. Yeah. But the more complex work, the more cerebral work, the work that requires creativity and imagination, for some time yet we won't have the, the systems that can replace that kind of work. Uh, in due course though, I could see something else happening. Because very often, and, and you'll know in the, in the literature about this, when people look at AI, they say, well, what are the tasks, in this case, a lawyer undertakes? Which ones could be done by a machine and which ones can we not imagine being done by a machine? And I think that's a limited way of looking at it because very often a lawyer will say to me, I'm a court lawyer, I stand up in court, how could a robot ever appear in a courtroom? And I say, for the foreseeable future, I can't imagine a, a lawyer being replaced by a robot in a courtroom. But what I am seeing is the emergence of online courts, which means that there'll be far fewer cases conducted in a physical courtroom. So you're right in saying that a machine can undertake the work of a human advocate, but you're wrong in thinking that means that job is safe because technology is allowing us a new way to deliver the traditional outcome. And this seems to me, as we move into the 30s, to be a very major challenge. And I find it hard to avoid the conclusion that uh, much, if not most, of the work that human lawyers do will be taken on partially or entirely by systems. So what would be your recommendation in terms of changing the education system for lawyers, changing their, their career development? What, what should they be looking at? In the broadest of terms, our universities have to start thinking through what kind of people will be needed in the future to help clients solve legal problems. And I'm saying that's not just traditional advisors, it's also people who develop systems mm -hmm. that can resolve problems. In broader terms, what I always say to young aspiring lawyers, actually I say it to businesses too, there's a very simple choice. And I say it's between competing with these systems or building these systems. By competing with these systems, you're saying, I hear what you say, Richard, uh, but you probably overstate it. You don't really understand what I do as a lawyer. And I think there's much I can do that a machine will never do. And that's going to be my career. Or a business will say that's going to be mm -hmm. our business. And I say, that I can't say you're wrong, but most of the trends are pushing in the other direction, suggesting that more work will be allocated to machines and less work to human beings. So rather than competing with these machines, why don't you be involved in building the systems that will replace mm -hmm. our old ways of working? And so I'll say to a young lawyer that I'd like you to be a legal knowledge engineer, I'd like you to be a legal systems designer, to build the skills for yourself, transportable skills, which will allow you to develop systems that will solve legal problems in new ways. So compete with these systems or build with the systems. It's a career choice, it's a strategic choice for businesses, 
And I'm encouraging people that I advise, certainly, to be involved, to be leading the way in building the systems that replace our old ways of working. That should see us through the 20s. Uh, whether or not there'll still be mileage in that in the 30s depends a lot on the advances of technology, because even a lot of the new roles I see for tomorrow's lawyers, I can anticipate at least some of them being taken on that machine as well. I couldn't agree more. Fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. Good. And one on the future of Of course. Yes. Very good. I'm here with, with Richard Suskind, um, a very accomplished author. Um, one of my favourite books that you've written is The Future of Professions. Um, I, I love this book because it challenges many preconceptions where people think robots and technology will take the lower skilled jobs. Mm. The point you're making is actually the medical profession, the legal profession, lots of professional jobs, the human experts, their jobs will now be challenged by artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, maybe you can summarize some of your, your key arguments yes. in, in, in that book that you wrote together with your, your son. Which is the reason it will always be special for me that Daniel, my son is an economist, he and I joined forces to look at a, a bundle of professions. We are, were working, he was working at number 10 Downing Street and I was working as an author and advisor and working in professional services firms. And we had the sense that the changes being brought about because of technology were not limited to one or two professions, every profession was going through similar changes. So we thought, why don't we go out and speak to the market leaders, mm. the, the thought leaders, the, the startups, the disruptors, and find out what's going on in medicine and law and architecture and audit, tax consulting, in education, um, in journalism, and even in the clergy. So we looked at all these professions and the broad theme we found was this, that as regards technology, there were two different phenomena coming through, two different futures. One, which we said was reassuringly familiar, was the idea that the role and impact of technology was essentially to improve what it is the professionals do today, to augment, support and enhance them. And the other role we saw emerging technologies, which frankly were displacing, disrupting, replacing the traditional professional model. And we saw a mixture of these, and some quite dramatic changes, you know, in Education, for example, in Harvard, we saw that in one year more people signed on for uh, their online courses than had attended that physical university since its foundation. In journalism, Associated Press, as long ago as 2014, were using algorithms rather than financial journalists to generate earnings reports. In tax, we saw that already more than 50 million people in the United States were using online services rather than tax advisors to submit their tax return. In law, uh, we looked at eBay. Every year, more than 60 million disputes, believe it or not, in eBay. Almost none of them sorted out by lawyers and judges, sorted out by something called online dispute resolution. In audit, you see this move away from what used to happen, the, the audit once a year based on a sample of financial transactions, at least to the possibility of real-time uh, audit in background, uh, working on all financial transactions. In architecture, I was just point to the uh, Hamburg Concert Hall, which is a remarkable building designed mainly by, uh, by algorithm. And of course, in the clergy, well, it's not of course, but it's a reality, we found this little app called Confession, uh, which had tools to help you track your own sin, options uh, for contrition, and even the Vatican got involved in the debate about whether or not this was suitable. So whatever profession we looked at, we're seeing some quite dramatic uses of technology. We decided to take a step back though and ask the question, why do we have the professions at all? Mm. Why is it that we give exclusive rights to certain occupational groups? Only a certain type of person is allowed to cut your body open. Only a certain type of person is allowed to appear in upper courts. Only a certain kind of person is allowed to make authoritative statements about the financial health of a business. Mm. We regulate, we authorize, we ring fence, and we call it the grand bargain. It's the grand bargain that says, we allow you to be the only people who can do X, Y, and Z. It's in the interest of the recipients, but in return, make it accessible, make it affordable, keep your knowledge current, and make sure we can trust you and that you are a remarkable duty of good faith to those you advise. And 
that's been the model in the print-based industrial society. But when you look at our health systems around the world, you can see they're creaking. Mm -hmm. You look at our educational systems, likewise. You look at legal systems, we have access to justice problems. So we're not actually in the print-based industrial society. The system's creaking, and we ask the question, might there be new ways of handling the old problem? And the old problem is this, that we define what is at the heart of the professions, is this idea what we call practical expertise. And practical expertise is a mixture of textbook knowledge and everyday experience. Mm -hmm. It's what your doctor, your lawyer, your accountant has. Mm -hmm. It's this amalgam of, as it were, content that they bring to bear. Usually when you get a problem of uncertainty, not, I'm in this situation, not sure how to classify or categorize it, sure as anything, don't have the knowledge or expertise to resolve it, so you go to a human expert. And so we define this expert as or the process of the professions really is our current way of producing and distributing practical expertise in society. Mm -hmm. And therefore our book is asking the question, might there be different ways of producing and distributing practical expertise in society? Quite near to the end of writing the book, the title was settled and everything, the title of the book, The Future of the Professions, and our premise, we're asking the question, what's the future of the professions? We realise we're asking the wrong question. And I don't mean this as a joke, but if you ask the question, what's the future of the professions, you're assuming they have a future. A better way of framing it is to think, how in the future will we be solving problems to which the professions today are the best answer? Yeah. And that leads you not necessarily to an automated version of the professions, it liberates you to think, well, actually, in an online world, we might be able to make available practical expertise in a new way. And the promise of education for 7 billion people, healthcare for 7 billion people, 7 billion people being able to understand and enforce their entitlements. We find that very exciting. Mm, hugely exciting. And, and you see this happening already in lots of industry and healthcare and education yes. where there are hugely popular apps, yes. tools. It is very interesting though that people often say, your book's very pessimistic. And we say, it depends which way you look at it. From the point of view we accept of the traditional provider, this is indeed threatening. But we're optimistic because we can see as never before that the recipients mm -hmm. of professional services might have alternative, more affordable, less forbidding, more practical, more available ways of resolving their difficulties. So we to this day maintain it's an optimistic book. We are writing, I should say, uh, we're just doing a second, well, it's not quite a second edition, more an updated edition where we're revisiting what's happened over the last five years. Believe it or not, it'll be five years since we wrote that book. Incredible. Mm -hmm. So, I think we are still seeing lots of people entering professions. Yes. We've got more accountants than ever before. People still become lawyers. They train to become radiologists, mm. even though machines can do this very well. What would be your recommendation mm. for the people when they make career choices? Well, there's an interesting question here as well, I should say, of timing, that although I think great advances are possible in a small number of years, there are often cultural, regulatory obstacles that stand in the way of immediate change. So I could imagine a system that would replace auditors in a very small number of years. I don't think that's going to happen mm. uh, for a decade or more. Uh, and again, there are very strong vested interests that would press against that. So I just want to say this is not just about technical feasibility. Okay. The general advice I give to aspiring professionals is, as I always say to lawyers, it's not about practicing law in the 20s as your parents or your uncle or your next door neighbor practices law. You'll still in the future be involved in solving legal problems, but you may be involved in the design of systems that solve problems rather than one-to-one -one consultative advisory service. So that's the message to professionals. We have this view that it is a one-to-one -one engagement but actually we foresee a more of a one-to-many relationship and that doctors, for example, can make content advice and guidance available to many people, mm -hmm. subject to all the limitations and of course the concerns people have over the accuracy and the robustness and so forth of these systems. But just the principle is to move away from one-to-one, -one, frankly, unaffordable service on a global basis to one-to-many, sharing that knowledge and experience more widely. And so I believe people who are coming out of uh, professional training just now should be open to the idea that they, one of their prime roles in the future will be involved directly in the design and development and 
implementation of systems that will replace the old ways of mm. the professions. I guess one challenge is you said that that professions become they they train and become experts through practicing. Yes. There's a real danger that we lose some of this human expertise. I yes. guess. Do you have some concerns about that? I've always been worried, and I've written in a number of my books about the question: How do you become an expert if you haven't been through your basic training, as mm. it were? Where do you cut your teeth? Yeah. It's interesting, I, I interviewed some young lawyers about this and I uh, went to visit them in a big city firm and they were doing huge document review exercise and I said, if this was done by machine, how would you learn to do it? And to a person, they said the same thing. They said, we get this after a couple of days. We don't need to do it for a couple of years. So I often cynically say, don't confuse training with exploitation. The reality is, as long as the market's prepared to pay for young lawyers to do these major reviews, Law firms are prepared to recruit and train individuals in great numbers. But I think this leads us to, in fact, one dimension of the book, which is fundamentally rethinking training. Mm -hmm. And I'm always, when I, when I look at an astronaut or images of astronauts um, for the first time stepping into their shuttle or whatever, they don't look around and say, oh, this is what it looks like. So it's funny, I didn't know what it was going to look like. Of course not. They've been working in simulators for years beforehand. And I think we need to do the same in the professions. I think we need to create simulated practice environments, mm. huge learning environments, uh, virtual environments, in which I suspect we can expose young professionals to a far wider range of possible experiences. Mm. So it won't come as a surprise to hear that I think the solution to the problem you rightly identify mm. is technology. Mm. Now, it's some form of technology. I think our learning technology has got some way to go, mm. but I could imagine that these people can learn rather than the two days they can learn that uh, uh, through immersion Completely. in in everyday experience mediated through these emerging technologies i'm not sure if people have fully grasped yet just how significant forms of virtual reality will be mm. in learning and educating uh, all of us and it's not just professional training it'll be lifelong learning too i couldn't agree more so what would you say are some the, the key takeaways that you would like people to take away from your, your book, The Future of Professions? What were, the, what were the top messages for you? In many ways, one of the most challenging messages, but enduring messages, to, is to think about the trades and crafts of the Middle Ages. The mercers, the cord winners, the tallow chandlers, people who worked with silk and with... Uh, leather goods and with candles. People still today want silk and leather goods and candles, but the way in which we produce and distribute them has fundamentally changed. It's no longer a craft. So what we see is we're moving away from professional service as a craft, as a bespoke service, to being increasingly standardized, systematized, and eventually commoditized form of service. So it would not surprise me at all if in a hundred years time, people will look back and say, solicitor, I wonder what that was involved. Or uh, uh, it, it, these crafts will recede. And the key point here is I don't think any of these professions are valuable in and of themselves. They're only valuable in the consequences they bring. Mm -hmm. Better education, improved health, understanding of rights and entitlements, better business. Mm -hmm. If the market, can find better ways mm. of delivering the solutions that the market requires, solutions to which professions today are the best answer, it will unflinchingly, it seems to be, default to these alternatives, to these technology-based alternatives. So for those people who say for their children, you'll always be safe in the professions, I think if you're thinking of the 20th century professional practice, you've missed the point. Mm. However, it seems to me for the foreseeable future, but not for all time, uh, uh, the attention of the profession should be turned to replacing the old ways of working with advanced systems that are appropriate in a digital age. Very good. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you.